So where we left off was with this etching from Goya and as one member of the student body so uh, nicely pronounced for us the statement in the bottom left corner says El sueño de la razón produce monstruos and we talked about the way that that expression is fundamentally ambiguous because sueño can mean dream so that the dream of reason produces monsters uh, and that's the sort of negative interpretation of the enlightenment now, on the other hand, it could mean the sleep of reason produces monsters, which is kind of an enlightenment sentiment. So I like this etching because I think it captures the divide uh, that exists in the way people have received the enlightenment. On the one hand, there are those who say the enlightenment is the best, absolute best thing that ever happened to us. And on the other hand, there's this view that it's in fact one of the worst things that ever happened to humanity. And here's Anthony Pogden writing in his book, the Enlightenment and why it still matters. No other intellectual movement, no other period in history has attracted so much disagreement, so much intransigence, so much simple anger. The key terms of almost every modern conflict over how we are to define and understand humanity, modernism, postmodernism, universalism, imperialism, multiculturalism, all of these ultimately refer back to the Enlightenment. So the Enlightenment is fundamental to any interpretation of modernity, whether it's positive or negative. You might be wondering, right, thinking back on the principles that we mentioned, why would anyone be ambivalent about these principles? Just in case you're not completely familiar with the term ambivalence, to be ambivalent is to feel two ways about something. So look at these ideals. You might say, these ideals are all fundamentally great things, right? Do we feel ambivalent, ambivalent about these things? No. Okay, so that, that might be your first response to that. But what I want to argue is that we are collectively, as a, as a group, fundamentally ambivalent about these ideals, but also as individuals within ourselves. When we reflect on these ideals, we realize that they can be interpreted in both a positive and a negative light. And you see this ambivalence reflected on the scholarly uh, reception of the Enlightenment as well. On the one hand, you have this movement that says, hey, we should carry out the unfinished project of Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was on the right track, it fundamentally had the right idea, moving towards rationalization, secularization, but it's been left unfinished, and really what all it needs, all, all we need to do is to perfect it. And on the other hand, there are those who say, unfinished project, really it's just an unmitigated disaster, uh, and so we should embrace um, an alternative path moving forward. It's one of, you know, and, and you can just pick, a, pick among the various posts that are available, and contemporary intellectual culture, postmodernism, post-structuralism, etc. So, how about some examples? Well, let's start with the objective truth. René Descartes, as we're going to see next week, argued that each person, in virtue of being human, possesses the natural light of reason. And the natural light of reason, right, your ability to think rationally, makes you intrinsically capable of discovering the truth the absolute objective truth. And the only thing that gets in the way is prejudice and convention. Now, objective truth is in turn linked to this ideal of mastery and possession of nature. The idea is that once we find a truly objective way to talk about nature, we can control the natural world. And instead of being at the mercy of nature, we'll be masters and possessors, lords and possessors of nature. Okay, so what about these ideals? Objective truth and mastery and possession of nature. Are we ambivalent about them? The answer is yes. A resounding yes. On the one hand, obviously there are people who are engaged in inquiry and in science who believe that they're discovering objective truths about the natural world and that our ability to do so is crucial to our success as a species because it gives us technological power and the ability to control our environment. But on the other hand, there are many people who think that the very notion of an objective truth is fundamentally naive. The idea is that everything that we know is fundamentally conditioned by the knower. And so all of our personal history, our, our social milieu, where we come from, all of these things shape the way that we know things, shape the way that we experience the world. And the idea that you could ever get outside of that framework for understanding things is naive. It's impossible. And then of course we're deeply ambivalent about our mastery and possession of nature. On the one hand, it's fantastic that we can control nature to the extent that we can, and it's made our species extremely successful at multiplying itself. But on the other hand, it clearly has had some, well, negative effects. Okay, so let's move to another example, free speech. This is an ideal of the Enlightenment that you might think no one is ambivalent about. People tend to have fundamentally positive attitudes about free speech. 
And free speech played a really important role in the Enlightenment itself. Some Enlightenment philosophers even argued that free speech is equivalent to Enlightenment in the sense that all that is needed for Enlightenment to spread is free speech and a free press. Because, as we already said uh, when we were talking about Descartes, every individual person has the ability to know the truth. Therefore, all you need in order to spread enlightenment is a free, pre free press that will spread the truth. Of course, that's not to say that all enlightenment fig figures had a positive view of free speech. Okay, so that's just to emphasize the importance of free speech uh, to the enlightenment. So let's turn back to the present. Free speech is something that has been hotly disputed in contemporary debates in the media. One figure who's played a major role in this debate is Jonathan Haidt. Here he is writing in The Guardian in 2016 about something that he thinks is very concerning on university campuses. He's, he starts with a story. Last month, in the early hours, an act of traumatizing racist violence occurred on the campus of Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Students woke up to find that someone had written in chalk the words Trump 2016 on various pavements and walls around campus. I think it was an act of violence, said one student. I legitimately feared for my life, said another. I thought we were having a KKK rally on campus. Dozens of students met the university president that day to demand that he take action to repudiate Trump and to find and punish the perpetrator. Now, if you look at these quotes, it sounds a bit like a satire, and that, of course, is Haidt's point. Haidt wants to defend freedom of speech as a fundamental necessary ingredient for the university and for free society in general. For any culture that wants to take truth as a fundamental aim, he argues, like his Enlightenment uh, antecedents, that free speech is a necessary component of that process. Like many others today, Haidt thinks that the movement on university campuses to take away people's right to free speech and to censor people, prevent them from having opportunities to speak on campus, is fundamentally at odds with the aims of a university. So, for example, Haidt and others are worried about things like this, the so-called uh, no-platform policy. No-platform is a policy of the National Union of Students of the United Kingdom. Like other no-platform policies, it asserts that no proscribed person should be given a platform to speak. So you can see why someone like Haidt says that these sorts of programs are fundamentally at odds with free speech. However, I also want to point out that people like Haidt tend to use the quotations that are most embarrassing for the people involved. And really, when asked about what the, what the reasons are behind those who endorse a no-platform policy, he tends to say, by his lights, there are no reasons that anyone should endorse such a policy. Critics of people like Haidt are going to respond by saying, look, free speech is, again, a kind of naive ideal. It, it was an important innovation of the Enlightenment, but it's naive in the sense that it totally ignores the sort of power hi hierarchies characteristic of human society. So when you say, just as a general policy in a liberal democracy, that we have free speech, that in no way guarantees equal speech, right? So in other words, to sort of put a spin on Orwell's famous quote, everybody has free speech, some people just have more free speech than others. A great example of this, I thought, came um, in the course of the American primary when Hillary Clinton was running against uh, Bernie Sanders and Bill Clinton was stumping for her at a series of events. And he was protested about some, some prison reform legislation that went into effect when he was in office that many people believe led to the dramatic, disproportionate incarceration of uh, black Americans. And the protesters were shouting, but the only person whose voice you could hear was Bill Clinton because in that situation, Bill Clinton has all the power, he has the political authority, he has armed guards backing him. And so you get the basic idea. The idea is that a, a no-platform policy is appropriate because uh, it's action taken in light of the fact that some people in a civil society have way more power and therefore have more free speech or freer speech than others. Okay, so let's just summarize what we covered in today's lecture. One, we talked about interdisciplinarity. I suggested that you try not to be disciplined, and what I mean by that is not to let yourself be confined to the barriers of one particular discipline. 
Uh, we also looked at some context of the Enlightenment. We saw the, the basic sort of bookends in terms of the dates that we're going to look at in this module. We talked about the Enlightenment being a disposition of thought and the historical process. And we also saw that Enlightenment basically involves self-governance, self-governance as an individual, but also the self-governance of states. Uh, and the project of Enlightenment ultimately took aim at what would eventually be a world society governed by rational law. Uh, and finally, in the third section, we just talked about the ambiguous legacy of the Enlightenment. We saw the, the ten principles, uh, and then we looked at some, some of these ideals and how people feel ambivalent about them. And now tonight, when you're home, I would ask you to do some retrieval practice for me. Think about this acronym, MORELAPS FDR. See if you can come up from memory with the ten principles, and also see what you can write about them, and, and also just start to, start to do some thinking about them. Finally, this is, a, this is a new requirement this year that I'm going to try to take care of in this video lecture here. Uh, this is coming from largely from the student union, I believe. They've asked faculty members to take a minute in the first weeks of teaching to tell your students what has been uh, done to improve or change the module in light of feedback. And we got some good critical feedback uh, last year, and the main criticisms, as I saw it, was feeling that the module lacked sense of continuity. Some students felt that there wasn't adequate guidance in their work on the assessment, and some students felt that there wasn't a good match between the activities that were being done in the seminars and the, the assessments that were being done for, for their mark, so the essays and the exams and so on. And so we've made some changes uh, in light of this critical feedback. We've tried to uh, change the structure of the readings, uh, and we're working to have more standardized seminars to give students a sense of continuity across the module. The Interdisciplinary Studies Center created a, another module, CS711, that you guys will be attending. And that entire module is aimed towards giving you the kind of guidance you need to be prepared for the various assessments. Uh, and finally, we we're really trying to gear the seminars this year so that they're designed to help you work on and develop the skills that you need to succeed, not only on the assessments, but overall in the course of your degree. Okay, thanks very much for listening to this. Uh, it was really nice to meet you all today. I'm very excited about working on the Enlightenment with you and getting to know as many of you as possible. Hopefully all of you.